Dakhal al Jannah. Whoever prays the two cool ones, right? The two prayers that are called the cool prayers or the cold prayers, Fajr and Asr. Is it Fajr? Right? The sun is just starting to come up and things are a little bit cooler than they are in midday. And the same thing at Asr. And both those times you feel the significance of the coolness. So whoever maintains them, whoever makes an effort to pray them on time, huh? al Jannah. So we're in the chapter of the Kathra, or the plenitude. All of the multifarious ways of doing good in the deen. And one of them is to just maintain these two prayers. There's transitive and intransitive goods. There's a good that is intransitive in that you're the one who benefits. Your devotions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your good intentions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? This is a way of doing good. And then there's transitive benefits, which are the benefits that uh, return to others. An effort that you might do for another person. And it can be as small as just smiling at someone. Right? And lightening the gel, lightening the atmosphere. And it can be as much as helping someone out when they have a time of need. And here's one just adhering to the devotions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he makes these things available. In hadith number 17, إِذَا مَرِدَ الْعَبْدُ أَوْ سَافَرَ كُتِبَ لَهُ مِثْلُ مَا كَانَ يَعْمَلُ مُقِيمًا صَحِيحًا if the slave gets sick or travels, whatever those things that they would do when they're at home or healthy on a regular basis of voluntary actions that are consistent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give that to them, will record that to them. SubhanAllah. So generous. Right? You're in the hands of someone who's generous. Part of Iman is realizing whose hands you're in. You're in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And part of the beauty of Ihsan is realizing how generous he is. SubhanAllah. And it's worth it to invest in some consistent actions. Because there may be a time when you need them. And when there's a there may come a time when you can no longer do them. But as you develop the consistency in them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that he'll maintain giving you the reward for them. In hadith number 18, from Jabir radiallahu anhu, قَالَ قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كُلُّ مَعْرُوفٍ صَدَقَةً Every good thing is considered sadaqah. So there's an edger for the sadaqah that you're going to give. We understand that as one of those voluntary actions that we gain increase from. But every good turn that you might do to another, everything that is ma'roof, right? ma'loomun urfan bil urfi, that this is something that's recognized by the society as being a good thing. And each of it is a sadaqah. This is a hallmark of Islam. This is a hallmark of the way of the believer in the world about increasing the good in the world about looking out for the good even when the return may not come back to us right but it does come back right even when we do something for the sake of another and there's no immediate dunya we gain for us allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still going to give a return to you but more importantly is our affiliation to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who's all about good and has made the deen of Islam a way of goodness. SubhanAllah. Shaykhuna Musafa Turkmani, rahmatullahi alayhi, he used to always say, uh, when he was teaching, he would pause for a moment and say, Sadli ala mu'allam al nas al khayr. Right? Send, your, send blessings on the one who teaches people what's good, or to do good. That was his way of saying, say salawat on the Prophet. <laughs> Right? Salli ala mu'allim al-nas al-khayr. Right? 
Say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on the one who teaches people what's good. That's the message of the Prophet ﷺ. For those who he is ma'roof to, well known to, they will know that he's all about spreading what is ma'roof in the world. And the ones who would follow the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ while knowing him intimately and loving him passionately will also truly be about spreading good in the world. But that good that we would spread in the world is a good that must be ma'roof. It's not a good that I think is good. It's not a good that makes me feel good. It's a good that people know and recognize this is a good deed. This has actually helped people. This has actually helped me. And it's recognized by the deen of Islam as being effective as well. So sometimes we have to stop and listen or look at ourselves in the mirror. I see myself as a good person. I see myself as someone who goes around doing good. Sometimes we have to stop and huh, take stock, audit ourselves. Am I really doing good? Or am I just making myself feel good? Am I just inflating my own ego? Or is the good that I do effective because it actually does touch people's lives? No. SubhanAllah. And for a people whose worldview is all about doing good and bringing goodness to the world, you would think that they would be interested in making these assessments to make sure they're on target to make sure that the efforts that they're making are on point and effective in the world and making changes in people's lives. And of course, changes in our own lives. Right? SubhanAllah. He says in hadith number 19, also from Jalir, that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يَغْرِسُ غَرْسًا there is no Muslim who plants a tree except that whatever is eaten from that tree is going to be a sadaqah for him, for her. SubhanAllah, the brothers and sisters in Memphis, first they bought a plot of land in the middle of the city and they built a garden. They handed out. Right? The, the produce, some, of the fam some families would take some of it home and they would hand it out to the non-Muslim neighbors. And then a few of the churches in the area actually started their own uh, community gardens after that. SubhanAllah, spreading good. It's infectious. Right? Initiated by Muslims and Islam. And of course, all of the neighbors, especially the elders, they knew who got this started. But then that wasn't enough for them. They got another plot of land and a grant from the city and they started a community orchard where they planted trees and they gave the fruit and the produce that came from the trees out to the neighbors in the neighborhood too. As well as I'm sure some families taking it home. I wouldn't get the specifics from them. Anything that comes from that is a sadaqah, but it doesn't stop there. He says, And anything stolen from his trees or produce will also come back to him as a sadaqah. SubhanAllah. Ajabal min amr al-mu'min. How amazing is the way, is the situation of the believer. وَلَا يَرْزَأُهُ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا كَانَ لَهُ sadaqah. And nobody diminishes the produce of his orchard, or of his tree, or of his effort, except that it will still be considered a sadaqah from him. SubhanAllah. And in another narration, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, فَلَا يَغْرِسُ الْمُسْلِمُ غَرْسًا فَيَأْكُلُ مِنْهُ إِنْسَانٌ وَلَا دَابَّةٌ وَلَا طَيْرٌ إِلَّا كَانَ لَهُ الصَّدَقَةٌ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةٌ And no Muslim plants a tree and a person eats from it, or an animal eats from it, or a bird takes from it, except that it will be a sadaqah for them until the end of time. SubhanAllah, you plant a tree, and the tree is something that remains giving and giving and giving, right, in its seasons. And even after the person has passed away, 
having planted that tree and the tree keeps on giving, or the effort keeps on giving, or the project keeps on giving, or the institution keeps on giving, or that amount of time that they spent to help someone else enhance their skills and they went out as a skilled person and are giving to the world and maybe teach someone else again and that those people are giving to the world except that it will remain as this sadaqa jariya an ongoing enduring charity that keeps giving returns even when this person has retired into their life of the grave Right? That is a very good 401k. But we have to look for an effective investment. What is an investment? What is an effort that has sustainability to it? And it's not just a weekend flash in the pan. Poof, lots of fireworks, but then all you smell afterwards is the smell of smoke. Right? And nothing remains. What are the types of things that if we look with a civilizational vision, if we look with a vision that goes all the way out into the future, and we say, this is that khair that will remain in the earth and continue to benefit the population, as opposed to pouring our efforts and our money and our ihtimam and our hem into the zabad, into the foam that will eventually dissipate from the surface of the flood waters. But as for what benefits mankind, the population, it will remain in the earth. And that's what we should be looking for. But this takes a civilizational vision and a lot of heart. And a lot of heart is not that sincerity that gets you into trouble, but, he, you know, he, he means well. No, a lot of heart is courage to stand up and do what's right, even when it's unpopular, because you know where this is going. And no community can survive without people who have that far-reaching vision, who see the bigger picture and not are just swept away by it. You know, little flashes in the pan and the little fireworks and things like that. Or the he said, she, 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 uh, he said, she said, right? Or whatever is trendy this week. No. There are people who start the trends and set the trend. They're the people who see. They're the people who understand. They're the people who believe. And there are others who are the first ones to jump on to the trend. And the majority of the people see them. But why are they on it? Because it's trending. The person who started the trend, there is nothing trending. They came and saw something and went to it, built it, initiated it, launched it because they knew that it met with their convictions. It met with something that in their experience of reality and in their vision is important for its own sake. And they did it. And there are those others who recognize when something is beneficial and they jump on to the idea that's at first released by another. And then there are the ones who just follow along. Maybe even leaders in their own right, but they're just talking about this thing. They're just trying to do the same initiative because someone else did it and it met with a lot of popularity. Not because they believe in it, but because it's trending. No. But the Muslim is smart and intelligent, perspicacious, right? insightful. It taku firasit al mu'min. Fa innu yandurubi nurillah. Fear the insight of the believer because he or she looks or sees with a light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What can we do to be in tune with a light that we may receive and shines through us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's what we should be thinking about. SubhanAllah. And there are ways to get there. No. SubhanAllah. Hadith number 20, also from Jabir, قال أراد بن سلمة أن ينتقل قرب المسجد فبلغ ذلك رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فقال لهم 
the tribe of Bani Salima, their homes were far from the Masjid of the Prophet in Medina, out on the outskirts, the edge of the city, and it was a very long walk to get to the Masjid. So they had this idea that they would all purchase homes and move closer to the Masjid, so it would be easier to be present and accounted for, and they wouldn't have to walk as far. So what are they seeking? Qum. To what? <clears throat> the Masjid at Medina is just a building. No. The teacher in the Masjid of Medina. And that in and of itself is a really good thing. They desire closeness to Rasulullah Sallallahu And why do they want to be close to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Because he's handsome? Of course. Because he has a nice smile? Definitely. Because he's Hanun, Raufun, Rahimun. For the believers, everybody wants to huh, be close to someone who's gentle and compassionate. Of course. But he's also changing their lives. Right? He's also filling them with meaning. He's also dispensing communication from the one who blew into them of his own created sacred soul that he made for the world. And that is attracted to anyone who who has a heart and is paying attention huh? and observant, watching, and seeing what's going on in his world as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an. So they want something that's good, but when the news of their plan comes to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he adjusts their entire perspective. We know now in hindsight that the footsteps that you take to the masjid have a blessing in it. But how was it that they were going to know that unless they're informed of it by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during that brilliant period where revelation is coming. Where we're learning about the ultimate reality of the universe and he says to them, Naam, ya Rasulullah, qad aradna dharik. Naam, excuse me. He says, Innahu qad balaghani annakum turiduna an tantaqilu qurb al masjid. It's come to me that you all want to move closer to the masjid. And they said, Yes, Messenger of Allah, that is our intention. And he said, Bani Salima, tribe of Bani Salima, diyarakum. Your homes, your traces will be written. Your home, he says it again, your homes, your traces will be written. Meaning, stick to the houses you have now, your original homes, and stay there because your footsteps will be recorded. And subhanAllah. Imagine showing up to Allah and saying, Ya Allah, I didn't get this right, and I have these shortcomings, and I made a mistake here, but the fact that my house was at a distance from the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't stop me from taking all of those steps to get there, back and forth every day. SubhanAllah. And the same thing applies here. SubhanAllah, the same thing applies here. You drive to the masjid, you go out, your intention is to be in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your intention is to learn something from Allah, from the Messenger of Allah, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want to go out to that masjid, to just pray two rakats in the masjid. And it's at a distance, it's an effort. Right? One person might say, uh, it's, it's so far. And there, right there, is the incitement, the enticement. Right? Let me make that effort to go out. Remember that what you came away with when you were last at the masjid, was it some sakina? Was it some tranquility of soul? Was it some type of upliftment? And remember <coughs> that feeling. You accomplished something. Or even that feeling that, subhanAllah, at least today, I was in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I had a quiet moment to pray. And that gives me a refreshing feeling, 
Remember that when you think, should I go or should I stay? Right? Because it will be written for you. Right? Even if you get in your car and you drive to your car. Right? Somebody uh, said to me that, SubhanAllah, maybe it will be good to park far from the masjid and walk to the masjid and get those footsteps. Well, the driving itself is an effort. And that's a good idea. But in that very idea is a solution for Yom Jumu'ah. We say we don't have enough parking. Well, there is parking. It's just not as close as we'd like to have it. But imagine if you parked at a distance where you could find a legitimate place to park with enough time to walk. Not everybody's lunch break suffices for that, we understand. But then we wouldn't be complaining about the parking lot is too small, and because it's too small, we're going to have two Jumu'ahs, one after the other. We understand the utility and the expediency of having first Jumu'ah, second Jumu'ah, and in some places in the country they might even do a third Jumu'ah. But the fact that our parking lots aren't big enough may lead us to make some policy decisions right now, but should set us in motion to be planning, well, how can we rectify this situation such that when we're holding our Jum'ah prayer, we're achieving the wisdom of Jum'ah itself. Jum'ah comes from Jama'ah, not just the word for Friday, right? The day of the week is named for the fact that everybody comes together. And not everyone is going to make it out to the masjid during the five prayers during the week. Some people only come out for Jumu'ah. That's the only time you see him. And for many people, Friday is the one contact point they have with the deen. Some of us who are in the masjid every day, work in the masjid, it's you know, we're always there, we see everybody. Huh? We're accustomed to uh, not, that not being our only contact point with the deen. But for many in the community, they at least get Jum'ah in. And that's when they come. And the wisdom behind Jum'ah is that there's one grand mosque in the area and all the smaller musallas in the town close down. And everybody walks that extra distance to get to the larger mosque and here's one khitab. Khutbah is the word for sermon. But also from khatabah is the word khitab, discourse. The discourse on the deen, that understanding of how the deen works in the current affairs of the world that we're in right now, and the entire community on Friday is receiving this single toji, this single direction. Because the one giving the khutbah is a person who is delivering public tarbiyah, community level tarbiyah, and understands the needs of the community and understands what's going on with the community. Maybe there's a problem brewing in the community. And there is a portion of people who are not handling that problem well. Okay. Maybe there is a qalaqan, there's an anxiety that the community is, is feeling. And from one week to the next, the discourse on Friday is going to the entirety of the people, and in the way of tarbiyah itself and its philosophy, it's taking them each week from level to level to level. This is called pastoral care, right, in this society. And our Christian brothers understand this. Our Jewish brothers understand this. And other faith communities understand this. And that's why, for example, in the classical Christian churches here in the history of North America and in Europe, the communities take their time to choose who their pastor is going to be who the minister will be, because they know they are going to put themselves in that person's hand to receive life guidance and to lead the community. So they don't rush into this, because they realize what it means. And each Sunday, the sermon builds on the sermon from the Sunday before. 
And so too is the wisdom of shepherding a flock on Fridays. And that's why if we find that the parking lot is too small, we should set in motion a plan to get a bigger parking lot. Or if the mosque is too small, then clearly there needs to be a larger mosque. When mosques are delivering on their raison d'etre, their reason for existence, people will find that they can expand their masajid. Because people find that that's the place where they can get the sweet flowing water that they need to quench a spiritual thirst. And it will happen. No. The wisdom of Juma is that the entire community is receiving the same message every week. And so when they meet one another and operate with one another and even go out into the society, there's a little bit of solidarity. There's a little bit of unity. People are working on the same page because they've understood the same discourse and directives of how we should be growing as Muslims together. How the things that we should be avoiding so that we're not polarized, right? And that becomes next to impossible to install in a community or to bring about in a community when everyone's hearing different messages, you know, and scheduling problems and all of this, and you know, we've got people maybe talking to the Muslims who maybe haven't figured all of this out yet. So it's one group's hearing this thing, and maybe the person comes and tells the exact opposite to another group, right? And we lose the wisdom of the Jum'ah, subhanAllah. <coughs> yeah, Rabbi. In the next hadith 21, عن أبي المنذر أبي بن كعب رضي الله عنه قال كان رجل لا أعلم رجلا أبعد من المسجد منه لا تخطئه الصلاة أبو المنذر says رضي الله عنه that there was a man and I didn't know anyone whose house was further from the masjid than this person but he never missed a prayer and it was said to him once, If you bought a donkey, you could ride it in the darkness, you were not going to trip over anything, and you'll get home a little bit faster. Whether it's riding to the masjid before Fajr, or riding home from the masjid after Isha, or when the sand is at its hottest. Right? And you know what it's like to walk on hot sand with bare feet. It would help you during the Ramda, which is where the word Ramadan comes from. فَقَالَ مَا يَسُرُّنِي أَنَّ مَنْزِلِي إِلَى جَنْبِ masjid. I would not be happy if my house was next to the masjid. إِنِّي أُرِيلُ أَنْ يُكْتَبَ لِي مَمْ شَعَيَا إِلَى الْمَسْجِدِ وَرُجُوعِ إِذَا رَجَعْتُ إِلَى أَهْلِ I want that my walk to the masjid and my return to my family be recorded for me. And the Messenger والسلام, heard what this man said, and he said, قَدْ جَمَعَ اللَّهُ لَكَ ذَلِكَ كُلَّهُ Allah has given you all of that. SubhanAllah. Allah has given you all of that. And that's the power of intention. Right? He's not complaining. But, He's enjoying the fact that his house is that far. Because he knows that he's showing Allah what he's got. He's showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dedication. And he has certainty in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an that Allah will not allow the effort of any male or female believer to be lost. And here is his effort, and this is what he has. SubhanAllah. Things like this have become a, a, a subtlety in our day, in our age. Right? Life can knock you about, and everything has to be so uh, brash and straightforward, and we lose our grip on the subtleties. We lose our grip on the subtleties. We lose our grip on the yaqeen, the certainty in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we lose our memory. 
We forget what Allah has promised. We forget where Allah is at. We forget the involvement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in each and every one of our moments. And with that heedlessness or that forgetfulness, we lose the ladha. We lose that sweet taste, that sweet pleasure of feeling in the marrow of our bones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us in, and present in each of our footsteps during the day. He's with us as a comfort. He's aware and he's also the cause of what's coming and is looking to be impressed with our responses. But this requires huh, a, an awareness and attentiveness to the world of subtlety and a remembrance. And that's what our dhikr is for. SubhanAllah. When we lose something from our effort, our project, someone takes from it, just like the person who plants the trees and receives that sadaqah, right? we get disturbed, we lose our temper, we forget the fact that that edger is counted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that effort is recorded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it counts for us as sadaqah because we've tried to put good in the world or with good intention, we're doing something maybe for, to benefit our family, planting an orchard, making an effort, working a job. And there's some losses incurred, maybe even someone comes and steals from it, but good went somewhere in the world. And that's the mark of the believer. That's the worldview of Islam. That the believer is here to increase that volume of good in the world. And this is a hikmah and a wisdom for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that world. Subhanallah. And the idea of orchards. The, I was once talking to one of my neighbors in Midan in Damascus and they said, you know that place where... Midan Sakka is where the railroad tracks are, and uh, for a period I lived uh, next to the railroad, the Hijaz Railway, right? The railway station that used to go from Medina all the way to Damascus. If anybody's ever seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia, right, he was always attacking the Ottomans. They were always attacking the Ottomans on the railway mm -hmm. and trying to derail the trains. That's the train tracks, and they used to go by my house. And there were new buildings there, and they said all of that used to be orchards. And this man is telling me that my grandfather used to have an orchard. And he was recounting what it was like to visit the orchard and all of this. And he said, you know, he used to do something interesting that, uh, and, and a lot of the, the orchard owners used to do this, and they call the orchard a ha'il, because it would be surrounded by a wall, right, and inside of the trees, so they would call it a wall. And when they went to take all of the oranges or apples or whatever it is that they were producing, lemons, they would get the bushels ready to be taken to market, but they would take a small percentage and they would put it in bins right outside the door of the orchard. And anyone who wanted could just walk by and take whatever they wanted and go on their way. Right? I said, subhanAllah. Right? They really used to do that. He said, yeah, they used to do that. I guess it's just the custom. Says Subhanallah. Don't you remember Surah Al Qalam? Right? And the orchard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and the family that owned the orchard, they said, This year, when we harvest, we're going to go out really in, early in the morning so that none of the, uh, the poor people will see us taking the harvest and we're going to take it all away from the, 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 orchard, uh, the, the, the orchard, we're going to take it all to market. And then nobody is going to come and make us feel like we have to give them some, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so they got up that next morning, right? So they went out in secret. And they went down to the orchard, but because of their intention by night, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent a whirlwind that whipped up and destroyed the entire orchard. Such that when they got to their spot, they looked and they said, we must have taken a wrong turn because this is not how we left it. 
we must be in the wrong place. But it ended up being the right place. And they realized that they had made <coughs> the wrong intention. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them a spanking. But what's interesting to me is how a whole society takes these things to heart and implements these things into their cultural practice to the point where people don't even realize where this practice originated. SubhanAllah. That they're, they've integrated into their way of life teachings from the Qur'an. These are Muslims. These are believers. They're not wearing Islam or even Qur'an on their shirt like a badge. They're listening to the deen. They're hearing the resonances and they're, they're seeing what it can do for their society. They're understanding that the wisdom, the hikmah at the heart of zakat is community solidarity. That's the hikmah that's there. That your wealth not become a monopoly amongst some people involved and that People at different levels of life, according to the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, feel that everyone is looking out for everyone. Right? It adds to the unity of the society. It's so palpable and so clear when we live in traditional societies where the wealthy and uh, those of slimmer economic means are seeing one another on a regular basis and living together. And it's clear how there's a need for that solidarity, but when everyone's separated out um, uh, with distances and they only see people uh, from their same economic class and the others are over here, we begin to think that we don't need that type of solidarity. But there's always a need for solidarity. And there's practical reasons for that need, and there's spiritual reasons for that need. And Islam is there to give us all of these different types of healthy things that we need. Even in the instructions of the relationship between a man and a woman, and a husband and a wife, there are things we're busying ourselves trying to shove Islam around and re-massage it and make it into something that suits us because of our sensitivities in the 21st century, instead of trying to learn and understand why Islam is saying that the relationship between, for example, a man and a woman, or children and their parents should be the way it is, which might bring a good, sustainable, and enduring health to us and to our relationships. SubhanAllah. We just need to listen. And we need to understand. And that's part of what it means to be a committed to be believer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in charge. Rasulina sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is leading us. And we're the followers. You know, we're not dictating to them how things should be. Right? We might learn something and we might gain from that learning. Alhamdulillah. We'll close here, inshallah. And we'll pick up next time with hadith number 21 barakallahu feekum alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin all praise is due to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all gratefulness is due to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to always keep our hearts conscious of his blessings Amen. and always keep our tongues wet with gratefulness and thanksgiving to him <coughs> An awareness that we don't walk on the face of this earth except by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us a deep understanding that will be a comfort to our hearts and a light in our way. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep the love of Rasulina sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an eternal spring in our hearts and that he show us the face of the Messenger والسلام, in our dreams. Amen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring good health and strength to our families, both in their bodies 
and in their minds mm -hmm. and in their hearts. Mm -hmm. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our efforts in this world be an illumination and a light in our graves that we will inevitably reach, but with husn al-khitam, a good ending.